Hello and welcome to another episode of the Artistry of Code podcast. Your hosts for today are Grzegorz Godlewski and Artur Wolny. So today we've met up to talk about what went wrong with microservices. And this episode is inspired by our friend Grazian, who was curious how we are going to uncover the subject of the microservices. So Grazian, that's for you and for uh, all of our listeners. Just before we start, guys, make sure that you follow the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Welcome to the Artistry of Code podcast, where we, together with our guests, are seeking ways of doing things right and having fun with it. Software, architecture, soft skills, teamwork, and other crazy buzzwords. Are you ready? Let's bring more value to the business. And we wanted to start off by bringing up a couple of stories. Uh, which are going to explain what we mean by what went wrong. So uh, what we've prepared for today is like three small uh, talks about those stories. And then we wanted to cover sort of like benefits and drawbacks, which you can have from microservices, including challenges, like always, uh, which come uh, uh, across with them. And we also try to provide some recommendations at the very end. So please make sure that you stay till the very end so that you can get all the knowledge from this episode. And just to say, it's not that we don't like microservices. Uh, it's just uh, this episode that we want to focus on the failure stories. So in most cases, microservices won't fail you, but just listen to what we what we want to share with you, our experience, and, and let's see how we can make it better. So Grzegorz, you have the like first, first story from our list, so uh, please tell us more. Yeah, so uh, it really comes to a quite recent experience when it comes to making bad decisions about microservices. And before I like describe what was the decision, I just need to point out to one bit of a recommendation that you can frequently come across when uh, reading about microservices is that you can structure your system, you can structure your microservices in a way that they are going to depict particular departments uh, or teams around your organization. So the classic example, which is brought in, in many books or articles, is that if your organization consists of like a payroll division or accounting division, or perhaps there's like a shipment uh, division, uh, you typically are going to create microservices uh, reflecting the behavior or modeling some processes which are running in those departments. Now, when I was reading this for the very first time, it, it really made a lot of sense for me. So w when I was uh, working at a company which was having very uh, distinct divisions, sometimes even not operating with an another, one another correctly, I followed this recommendation blindly. And this led to a situation that I've designed the system and there were those two microservices in that system which were reflecting two divisions within that company. And it was all based on the assumption that at some point uh, we are going to have two teams working with those uh, services. Meaning if you, if you also come across recommendations, you will also see that recommendation that each and every microservice should have only one team who's going to maintain it. And like specifically, you kind of set on like an equation that you have one microservices, one team. And on paper, the, the, the whole thing looked quite nicely. Uh, everybody like really agreed to that when I was consulting this idea and with, with many people. But there was that problem that the basic assumption taken there that microservice A is going to be maintained by team A and microservice B is going to be maintained by team B turned out to be wrong. And we ended up with, with a situation that we've created a system which had those microservices defined separately with the idea that are, they're going to be developed and maintained separately, but it wasn't the case. So then the team A really ended up with having the microservice A plus microservice B together in their code base. The problem which em immediately emerged is that the those microservices, they were also 
frequently changing together. So if you want to develop a, a feature, like a, a new functionality, then you had to modify both services. And this already rings a bell. If you are coming from the solid world, this is already ringing a red uh, a bell and litting a red light that probably the design here went wrong. And it really did. Because later on, we had to revert that decision and merge those services in order for the team A to be really performant. And probably at this point, those services, even though they were merged, they were like uh, correctly separated into modules. So that's <laughs> still some improvement. Uh, also, uh, in defense of, of the microservices, I must say that it's it wasn't... Uh, for, for me, it doesn't sound like a problem with the microservices itself. But uh, what I find very demanding when actually designing the system based on microservices is a correct um, identification of bound contexts, right? So uh, in this case, it, it might have been that those two services was actually a single bound context, yeah? Even though the they they were like separately uh, developed and on some on some uh, one was influencing the the other one yeah? uh, in and they were like dependent on each other very strongly so it might be the case that that just the bound context was not identified as it should and that was the uh, the that w might have been the uh, problem that you spot on yeah so starting with monolith in this case is is usually uh, much better because <laughs> you don't have all those uh, possibilities to make it wrong yeah of course you can uh, like tangle it uh, too much the code uh, between the layers especially when you're implementing some kind of pipeline it might be very difficult then to untangle it when the scale comes in but uh, yeah, especially at the beginning of, of the project, it's better to you know, like focus on the functionality and prove it's working rather than uh, trying to make that pipe shiny and you know, frictionless at the beginning. Yeah, so definitely something which was a game changer for me uh, when I'm when like looking into the past was that I came across domain driven design and those concepts of you know like bounded contexts and aggregates things like that too late I would say because if I would be having that knowledge prior to making those decisions I probably would have made those decisions like better. The other option is that if I wouldn't fail with those microservices, I probably wouldn't see the value in DDD that much, right? Because sometimes it's your experience telling you, oh, so this is how you do it, right? And not the other way around, because going into DDD directly without having some bumps earlier uh, earlier on in the past may not give you that wow effect because then you're actually going to understand the problem which is going which is about to be solved by uh, ddd but uh, then again when we talk about structuring things arthur you also have a a, a story slash problem related to microservices yes yes i also encountered one actually in in, in in more than one place. And the problem is that uh, maybe it's not a big problem uh, because yeah, that's that's what we do, solving problems. But we, uh, we used to focus on the, on the bound context uh, so much uh, when designing microservices that we uh, don't think about like technical problems that might occur, uh, you know, in, in later developments yeah so let's say that we start with some uh, simple microservice to, to to solve problems of some small bounded context and that's the mvp so you have some kind of api it's serving data it's storing something in database very simple example then you know your uh, project is, is developing new requirements come from come from uh, the product side and you know this maybe the scale is increasing uh, and it might happen that you need to introduce the asynchronous communication which is uh, very common in the microservice world so in this case let's say that your microservice now needs to read also some asynchronous messages yeah, coming from other places in the system and react to them and the common mistake that i saw in my experience is that 
usually developers uh, together with architects, uh, you know, the, the, the code creators decide to go an easy path and merge the uh, consumption of those messages into the code base that serves the API as well. And when the system behaves uh, like we uh, expected, so we don't have like big spike, uh, spikes of uh, of usage, we don't have any, uh, you know, like DDoS attacks, etc. We don't see the problem. But when the problem comes, when the load is very high, it might happen that uh, the asynchronous uh, consumption will affect the cooperation with your API. And depending on what is your like core business value, if the core business value is, for example, taking requests from your users, then, then you have a problem because your application becomes unresponsive. Yeah, so your availability uh, drops. You have uh, like contracts probably for your contractors if they're using your API. And this begins uh, to be not a technical issue, but like general company issue that you know they that, that can be connected with uh, with cash. So my recommendation here is always think about it. Yeah, always think what is your core value and try to predict the problems. So well, I would I would only add here is that this rings a bell in regards to the scaling recommendations coming from the 12 factor application so that in that way of implementing uh, apps you are going to define uh, tasks per process type essentially it, it calls out to scale using the process model which is you're going to define separate tasks uh, really separate processes depending on the task which is um, to be handled by that particular code right so if you're having let's say let, let's put this draw this image you're going to have like a microservice which is going to serve rest request is going to have an grpc endpoint uh, is going to have a couple of workers you don't put this into a single node app in terms of on the same event loop instead you can have this in the same code base, but you define multiple entry points, which you scale separately so that if you need to scale the worker a little bit more, even in the same app, you're just going to scale the worker process multiple times. And you don't have to have distinct code bases really for those. You still can have a single repo. You just define those tasks and the roles um, inside the application. Yeah, that's right. And you have like many good points uh, that, that you can benefit from uh, using the same repo. Like you, ha you have the, the same code base. You don't need to carry about uh, other repositories or the libraries. You don't need to bump them if there is a bug. You just use the same code base uh, by exposing like different artifacts or one artifact with many uh, entry points, like you said, that can be uh, configured as different microservices in Kubernetes, for example. Yeah, so this is how it should be done, and we we, we know that we we have done it right once <laughs> in our career together, Gregor. So, 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 but uh, the temptation usually is there to you know when you are, are about to focus on on the business value, especially in a startup like companies. Then the uh, thing to actually introduce the separation to different processes is an another cost that needs to be you know laid on the on the scale. Yeah, so you need to think about it. Uh, but 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 I want wanted to emphasize that it might uh, give you problems with uh, with production in the future. So uh, yeah, think about the 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 weight of this decision. So let's go to our last example. Yeah, and, and that's that's something which I'm bringing, I guess, in the in the in the last year. I'm bringing this one too much, but I'm going to bring it up once again. I think that for me, that's the biggest failure when it comes to uh, using microservices, which I was uh, participating in. But I wouldn't say this is due to microservices themselves. That's more about the hype and bad. The organizational decisions. So 
Once upon a time, not so long ago, I had the possibility uh, to work on a team where everybody was senior and everybody was microservices. And that combo turned out very, very uh, wrong uh, for a number of reasons. Having a team composed only of seniors is essentially giving you dysfunctional teams this way. That, that, uh, full stop. I'm just not going to comment uh, on that. You can just imagine what can possibly happen. It's not that everybody argues because seniors Normally, they don't argue. They're being polite and politically correct and don't get anywhere <laughs> with, with this. Yeah, but they're <laughs> boiling inside. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they tend to isolate and this leads to strange behaviors or situations. Like if you have people who are not able to talk to one another and, you know, like get, get things solved on a design level. And you have microservices, which creates escape rooms for those people. Everybody can go to their own escape room and then you, you, you start to feel what's going on, right? This, this isn't going to go into the right, right direction. So if you... Yeah, the, the low bus factor, yeah. And <laughs> not even that. Things. So the, the, the thing is that with the Microsoft, even if, even if those people would go to different rooms in, in regards to the microservices, everybody's going to have their own comfort zone within the, those microservices. If they struggle to collaborate, those microservices won't collaborate either because that's, again, Conway's law and that's going to reflect the organization. And if the team is dysfunctional in that regard, the resulting microservices will be also. And the, the problem now, so, so that was the, like the decision-making or the organizational problem part. It then like broadcasted towards the technology so that you had microservices in from day one. And the problem here, putting aside that, you know, like that note about people isolating themselves within their own context and doing their own piece of like work. The problem was that from day one, you invited a heavy technological stack of asynchronous communication over Rabbit, REST, things which may fail, stuff like that. So at the end, and that was a Greenfield project. That's very important to state. So how the story ended up was that the team was building up more of a, like a payroll system using microservices, but all of the technical details which were necessary to get through pretty much stopped development of the business uh, features inside of those services. So there was a lot of hassle when it comes to building it technically and eventually the project ran out of money. <laughs> so uh, we, you had a senior team, which was very expensive. You had microservice uh, uh, architecture, which was very expensive and little outcomes because of the complexity of that situation, which ultimately doomed the whole project. Biggest failure that I was that I was able to participate in, and uh, as you can see, I only smile when I when I talk about that. Just, what, what a beautiful disaster, Gregor! Um, sounds for me like you know the orchestra on Titanic, yeah, and they were like <laughs> going down, but the orchestra was still playing. So, yeah, 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 and you know that's uh, I learned something from from this, which is which is do not go early into the microservices, really. Uh, and, and that's why I, I, based on that history, I cherish the idea of modular monoliths to start from as, as really the way to go. Even if I'm building my stuff, I always start with the same uh, single application. I do that task dividing for workers and uh, web servers uh, inside of that app, but I'm not running into a microservices immediately. This is something which we're going to talk about like uh, in a minute. So with this, Arthur, we, I guess we've went close to the challenges, right? And the benefits and the drawbacks. Okay, so let's go to pros and cons, right? Of, yeah. of the microservices versus monolith. So I feel, Arthur, that you would like to start. <laughs> maybe, maybe I can. So uh, yeah, the, the first cons of, of microservices is that uh, you have uh, so much extra work to start with to make it work. Yeah? So 
now everyone works with Kubernetes. It's another buzzword, another honeypot, <laughs> I believe, for developers. So uh, to make it running, you either ha uh, need to have developers that uh, are able to configure uh, your cloud and configure uh, deployments uh, for your application. And each new microservice needs to, uh, needs to have its own deployment configured. Of course, it can be somehow automa uh, automatized uh, or, you know, like at least use Using some templates, but it's another work that you need to do. Creating a template is is the work itself that needs to be done. Even though it uh, saves us um, some time, someone needs to do it. And uh, I see that that also DevOps uh, engineers aren't that uh, you know that the, the group that is over overflown yeah uh, on the market so usually you have like two three devops and usually they are shared across many teams so they have lots of work already so it might be a wise decision to not add the work for them yeah just try to reduce it as possible do you have Gregor, some other drawbacks of microservices so I guess we've covered this during the show mostly, so I'm just going to do a quick recap. That's a complexity exploder, uh, really. And if I would say that, what, if I would to answer a question, what are developers responsible for? Is like implementing uh, solutions to real business problems and keeping the complexity uh, controlled. And if you, go with microservices for the start it, you're going to have a, a big problem uh, very soon if you didn't you know like had prior experience with this so just don't do it that, that's that's what i would say when it comes to microservices and uh, dealing with the complexity of like repositories synchronizing versions uh doing big releases i mean the big promise was to be able to release things separately Okay, you can release things separately if they are engineered correctly and you didn't go across bounded contacts. Otherwise, you will have to synchronize changes and releases, and that's always going to be a, a big, big problem. I, I, in general, came to the conclusion over the years that you need to do an exercise before you go into microservices. And it, even if you would start with solid principles and uh, object-oriented programming, really. Try to design an application with classes, with modules, and try to throw changes at this application. So let's assume you've created an app which is going to, I don't know, like take food orders, and then you're going to be requested to add some sort of like a payment a scheme to this or some sort of a, like a discounting scheme or perhaps some extras and now within the same app within the same repository file next to the one which you've just created you're going to see if your design thinking was correct because if you are going to end up modifying a lot of classes or a lot of objects in the same application that means the way you design is not fitting microservices complexity, right? So you can do that exercise earlier without Kubernetes, without uh, having all of that hassle of deploying microservices just to check if you did them right. No, it starts with finding the areas of responsibility. It starts with finding the bounded contexts, and then you can test that model even on a number of files instead of building the whole system and then figuring out that you did it wrong. So uh, I think this is the, the, the one of the biggest challenges when it comes to the going with microservices. This is learning how to design software in a way that it can really leverage the benefits of microservices because they, they have those benefits. The horizontal scalability, right? You can spin up as many instances of the services which you have, but this is requiring you to have some basic knowledge and uh, well, basic is uh, like really underestimated here. It, it's not basic. It, it requires you to have solid knowledge about software design to get it right before it's there in, in production. And that's the, the biggest thing because then you have all the technicals. Like if you have remote calls, 
they can fail. The server on the other uh, side can you know, like, like become unavailable. It can be rate yeah. limiting Lots you. Lots of branches of code. Yeah. So, the, the, but then again, different effects come in, like back pressuring, for instance. So if you have m multiple services and the one at the end is uh, struggling, so you need to back pressure. So put that pressure back to the beginning of the system so that the users at the very beginning, they're not going to uh, destroy the initial service, issue as many requests as possible so that the service at the very bottom of the stack can really have a break and recover from the surge of the traffic. And if you have the chain of uh, services long, this is only getting worse and worse because you have to solve it on each and every chunk of the system. So yeah, that's that's a lot of things to take care of, really. Not in a Greenfield project, not day one. <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. And uh, except for the, the design complexity, you also need to introduce the communication between them. And that's some kind of organizational complexity for me. Because when, when you start with microservices, and then let's say that you need to, you, you will distribute it, uh, to some different uh, teams, then uh, adding any cross-team functionality, cross-microservice functionality will cost you more. Yeah, And uh, like re reacting quickly, especially in this uh, startup uh, environment, is very difficult because first you need to uh, talk to the other team, like uh, try to predict the communication protocol, you need to design APIs, you need to wait for them to implement it. They might have their own problems with priorities, for, so because they may uh, have, have been you know, given some other very important tasks to do. Yeah, like I said, you need to, uh, in the end, uh, deploy it sometimes uh, in a synchronized manner, so both uh, of them at the same time, or when you start implement some feature flags that might not be needed for you, but now uh, the, the requirement might come that another uh, extra work needs to be done. So there's a lot of complexity while you don't benefit the, the main benefit that gives you uh, the, the microservice design, which is the scalability. Eh? When you don't have clients, then you don't need to care. And I've heard it uh, recent uh, podcast that uh, the only moment to consider microservices is when your uh, scaling is not sufficient. Yeah, so if you see that that your application is suffering from load, then you need to stop with implementing uh, new features and start refining your design. And refining your design doesn't mean immediately going to microservices. Yeah, especially that going with microservices. On the other hand, with the micro <laughs> prefix is a thing to go. Yeah, yeah. Ha Please raise a hand or write a comment uh, to whoever who worked with really microservices. Yeah, in my case, it was usually just services. Yeah, so the bounded context wasn't micro. It was like some starting context plus everything that that fits the best <laughs> yeah, when when we needed to add it. So. Uh, that's how usually it's implemented. You just reminded me about uh, another promise, which was there, uh, is that if you have different microservices, uh, you can run different technologies. So you can have one microservice in Node.js, other in Python, the third one in Rust, the fourth one in C++. Who saw that? Yeah. I mean, who saw because that? Because <laughs> there are so many developers on the market available, yeah. so you can pick one yeah, for, <laughs> for whatever technology you would like to. Yeah. We even we we even have buckets for Java developers, right? So it's like there's a microservice <laughs> for you in this company. Oh, yeah. So the in looking at this from you know like perspective, we can only laugh. We've learned a lot about this, and we need to admit, I, I guess me and you, Arthur, that we were hype driven in those situations. But I think it's really uh, very hard to like avoid this, especially that if you don't have prior knowledge, you can't really assess that conference talk, whether that's bull crap or not. So it all comes with experience, uh, really. Okay, so since we are uh, slowly getting to the end of the show, I think we can uh, quickly form a general recommendation. So Arthur, would you be so kind and give yours? 
and then I can yeah, provide I, mine. I think I, I already told it, but I will try to uh, conclude it in a few words. So uh, go with microservices when you have problems with scale. Uh, when you're beginning your project, focus on the most valuable product you can deliver from the user perspective. So think of spending your time on things that will actually bring you clients, bring you money, uh, bring you this uh, economical fluidity. Yeah? Then you can think about refining your product. So if you really want to be smart before you start, just uh, when implementing the, the monolith, just follow some rules that applies to microservices but on the level of our modules in the monolith architecture. So when you create the, the feature, create, uh, let's say, uh, modules that would be otherwise the microservices, uh, be uh, strict when it comes to reusing the internal uh, parts of the other module, always try to provide entry points to your module and use only them. So this will give you a good starting point for future improvements when the scale will be rising. Yeah, and tracking this on the module level, like employing things like clean architecture and segregating the interface. So that's only one service uh, dealing with the module, um, like a being at the front end of the module for the other modules, then you can simply, well, simply, that's the trap. You can simply swap the module with the microservice, changing everything to asynchronous, and then that's it. And that's on a consultant talk, right? So you can simply switch it. No, it's not simple, you bastard. It's it's always complex, so it's it's not going. It's easier, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so at least when it comes to you know the, to those interfaces, okay. So I I totally agree, Arthur, um, with this. So starting with monoliths, preferably modular monoliths, when you can apply the design thinking about you know like how to slice things, you can test early if your way if your structure if how you've reflected the business uh, is working fine. You don't sacrifice the speed of delivery. You, you actually gain it because you're doing this inside of a, like a monolith. And you scale when you know which part is really having the issue. And essentially, the path of being a module in a monolith and becoming a service, I think this is the natural and the only way uh, how microservices should emerge from an existing code base. But also, that's the way how to get things back if you integrate services. There's also one recommendation which I would like to add on top, especially in the startup context. And this is related to bounded contexts. I had the pleasure to be on a very nice training when it comes to event storming and domain-driven design. And the lecturer there, and I'm going to greet Sławek Sobutka here, where he mentioned a very important note about where you, when you really shouldn't go to a certain level of event storming and then by consequence going into DDD. This is when you're working with a customer, client, or a, you know, like a company who doesn't know their business. And if you're in a startup, the startups typically, they're trying to find their business model. They're trying to identify their customer. They're trying to identify the problem. And the, they have a theory that they have a solution, but they don't know whether the problem exists, whether that's the solution for the problem. So there's a lot of evaluation there. And then bringing, you know, like heavy weapons uh, in such places like bounded context, DDD, doing all of that engineering, uh, building this all up, right? The, that's a big uh, oven hassle. And then it might be the case that in two weeks, the hypothesis about the customers turns out wrong, and then you need to throw everything away, right? Uh, or at least the majority of it. And then microservices won't help. So before you like apply the design thinking, uh, before you employ things like event storming, like uh, DDD, like microservices, make sure that the people and the company which you're working with knows their business and knows the problem. Because if you're going to build up a big technical solution, invest all of that effort in making this happen, and then it turns out that the business goes the other way, you just created so-called technical debt. So the technical debt defined as the amount of work which you need to do in order to get back in line with the business, 
right? So you need your architecture should always be flexible to follow the shaky business. And if you over engineer and over invest, that's going to be a big, big problem. So I guess that's going to be all for today. So once again, uh, this is the point where we are finishing the episode. It took us a little bit longer than we initially expected, but I really enjoyed it. And I really enjoy, you know, like uh, ranting on uh, microservices <laughs> specifically. Uh, so yes. Yes, and we are willing to hear your examples uh, of misuse of microservice concept. Yeah, share with us using the comments or send us a message. We will be very grateful. Maybe we can even talk about your examples and comment it. That would be a very nice idea. I, I, think, I even think that, Grazian, if you disagree with us on, on this episode, you're going to get invited as a guest to the show so that we can <laughs> discuss this on air. But as for now, guys, thank you very much for staying with us. Uh, please uh, make sure that you follow the show on your podcasting platform and one of our um, uh, social media pages. Have a nice rest of the day. See you. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye. That's all for today. Thanks for spending your time with us. Visit our page on Facebook and Twitter, leave us a comment under the episode, subscribe to the updates and share it with others. We would like to hear your feedback so that we can prepare more interesting content for you to enjoy. Hear you next time. Bye.